I'm about to embark upon a multi-series exploration of string theory, and so it's going to be a crazy ride, so just strap in, make sure your arms and legs are inside the vehicle at all times, and pay attention, okay? And we're going to start not with string theory, but we're going to start with something we call the standard model of particle physics. The, the standard model is... It's a kind of a standard model. It's the model. It's the only model we have of three of the forces of nature, of electromagnetism, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear. Gravity, we'll, we'll talk about next week. Don't worry about it. Just, just pretend these are the only three. It describes how these forces interact and how these forces interact with the particles and uh, pieces, the building blocks of our everyday world. We're talking about electrons. We're talking about protons and top quarks and neutrinos and how these all mix and play together in our everyday world. The standard model is incredibly powerful. It is by far the most well-tested theory in all of science. Take that, biologists. It's all of science. It is the most well-understood theory and the most well-tested theory. It's successful. Okay, we've had it for decades. We can describe interactions to minute detail, like even smaller than I can pinch together my fingers. We can describe these interactions. But it's not without some weaknesses. You know, we got to admit, it's got to admit, the standard model isn't quite perfect. There are some things that uh, we don't understand. And there are some things that we, we really don't like about the standard model. So let me start with the parts of the standard model that we don't like. In the standard model, everything is a field. Everything. Uh, you have a, uh, an electron. You, you, if you're holding an electron, Really, there's an electron field that permeates all of space and time. And what we call a particle, an individual electron, is really just a piece of that field that got excited to high energies, and so we call it a particle. And same for a photon, that's a piece of the electromagnetic field. Same for the top quark, that's a part of the top quark field, etc., etc., etc. So all these fields overlap on top of each other. The problem is, what we don't like about the standard model is that when we go to calculate, when we go to do some math, when we say like, hey, let's say two electrons are going to bounce off of each other and we want to calculate that interaction, we want to run that interaction, we want to see how it operates, like we just want to understand it, like how, how strongly are these two electrons going to bounce off of each other. In the very simplest picture, two electrons come close to each other. They're going to interact through the electromagnetic force, which means a little photon is exchanged, and then they go on their merry way. But the simplest picture doesn't always happen. And the simplest picture doesn't always happen because particles, or what we call particles, can change their nature if they feel like it. It's the weirdest thing in the world to think about, but this is reality. This is the way the world works. When these two electrons come in and then there's a little photon wiggling between them, that photon, for reasons known only to the photon, can spontaneously split into become an electron and a, and a positron, a little pair of particles. So the electrons come in, there's a little photon on its way communicating the message that they're about to interact, and then it splits into a, an electron and a positron, and then it recombines by the time it hits this electron. And each one of those electrons and positrons can themselves split off to become photons. Like it, Very, very quickly, you discover that all the possible ways that these two electrons could possibly interact happen. Think about that for a second. When two electrons interact, every possible way that they could exchange anything happens. 
And so when you go to calculate, like, how are these electrons actually going to behave, you have an infinitely long list of things that you need to work on, and that is painful. <sighs> Thankfully, we've developed some techniques, uh, primarily uh, derived and figured out by Richard Feynman and some others, where you can you can kind of pretend those infinities don't exist. Like you have this infinitely long list of potential interactions between two electrons. You can package them up in such a nice way, and you can put them in a little corner, and then you can maneuver and mush around the mathematics to put them in one little place and then it's like there's this big unknown quantity you don't know and, and you actually get to replace it with something like the electron mass so you can just put in the electron mass and it just squashes all the infinities and then you can make calculations so this is great because it allows us to actually make predictions and do our theory and everything but it's bad because you need to input numbers into the standard model that have to be derived from experiment. The standard model doesn't tell you what the electron mass is. The standard model doesn't tell you what the speed of light is. But all these numbers are important for actually calculating interactions. And so that's something we don't like about the standard model is there's things that we have to put in by hand and it's this tower of infinities when we go to calculate infinities or when we go to calculate interactions that's the reason why and besides that there are just some like general mysteries of the universe that we wish we could understand like why is gravity so weak like gravity is billions upon billions upon billions of times weaker than the next weakest force. Isn't that kind of weird? Like you have strong nuclear, electromagnetism, weak nuclear, and then it's like, wow, gravity is way down there. Gravity is weird. We don't understand why. Neutrino mass, we got no clue about neutrino mass. Uh, dark matter, don't even get us started on dark matter. Like we just have things we don't understand that the standard model doesn't capture. And so there is an urge and a desire to come up with something better, something that you don't have to plug in the numbers, something that could explain the weakness of gravity. What could it be? It might be string theory. And we'll keep this exploration going. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Do all the usual YouTube stuff. And please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep these shows going. And I'll see you next week.